So I think uh, this is what we ended the class with the last Thursday. I did a quick demo, but we didn't have time to actually work it out in any detail. Um, so problems 11 and 12, that's the, um, these are the problems that this, excuse me. Um, these are the problems that describe the setup, but uh, what I'm really interested in is actually problem 12. Does that sound familiar? Okay. So um, that's what this setup is here for. This time I taped it down with a sturdy tape so it won't, um, <laughs> it won't come down. So um, let me um, do the demo again as a reminder for people who might ha not have been paying attention towards the end of the class. So you know, this is loop the, uh, what, do we call, what do they call it? Loop the loop? Um, it's a you know, loop of the tracks. <laughs> and um, so you know, if, I, if I push this ball with enough speed, then like the thing on the roller coaster, it goes around, and it'll make it to the other side. So what I did last time is, is instead of pushing it, I raised this to this height so that I can simply roll the um, ball down from a height. Then, you know, you, you know, it gains kinetic energy as it rolls down, and hopefully by the time it comes here, it's moving fast enough that it can go around and do that. So this is a demo we did last time. It yeah, goes around. <laughs> does that. I have another ball. I'll get it later. <laughs> so, you know, once again, it does this. That. Okay. So the question we ended the class with the last time was, um, or the situation that we are looking at last time was, all right, so we are looking at what's the minimum speed this has to be moving at, or another way of phrasing the question, is what is the minimum height it needs to start from so that it'll have enough energy to have enough of the speed here so that it has enough energy to end up here. And the intuitive guess and example I illustrated was, all right, so we wanted this to come to at least this height. So let's say we are going to start it at about the same height as where we want it to end up. And I'm going to move it, it's about the same height right now, right? Yes. And I'm going to move it up a little bit to account for friction, because that's always going to be there. Now, when I release this ball from here, same height plus a little bit for friction, you will see that, well, it doesn't actually go through the loop. So let me do it one more time. Same height, a little bit extra for friction. And it doesn't, it's, I mean, it's not quite enough energy. I mean, so when you look at it carefully, it doesn't quite reach this height, right? So did we end uh, with enough time to discuss why it didn't have enough energy to actually reach this point? We may not have. OK, so let's just start with the question. So this is one of the things that you have to watch out for when you're applying conservation of energy. So let me diagram this situation here. So let me call this worksheet 7. Ah, Can I get the ball? Thank you so much. Um, let me call this worksheet seven, problem um, 12. So um, the part that we are looking at in particular is the loop section. And we were hoping that the ball would eventually be at this position at some point, right? This is one of the snapshots we want it to, we hope to have available. So let me call this um, snapshot two. And we are trying to figure out, all right, so where does the ball need to start at snapshot one so that it will be able to get to this position? And we are thinking about, OK, what's the minimum height it needs to start? So we are thinking about what is the minimum energy the ball needs to have here. Good. Let me state the obvious things to get some things out of the way. So at a minimum, the ball needs to have enough potential energy to be here, right? Yes? So um, let me write down some of the parameters. So the radius of this track, let's say that's the radius r. So um, we would say, all right, at a minimum, so 
at a minimum, we would say this ball needs to have in enough uh, potential energy. So its uh, potential energy should be at least be uh, its mass times g times the height, which will be twice the radius. Right? And when we made this guess, or when I made this guess, because you know I was running out of time, uh, when I made this guess that maybe I could have started this height here and have it have enough energy to reach this position, what assumption was I making about minimum required kinetic energy at this position? Zero. Zero, right? Because I start this ball with a zero kinetic energy here. If energy is conserved, then I'm expecting this to get to this position with the zero kinetic energy. So that's what I was uh, trying to state, that I was trying to say at this position, the ball will have minimum potential energy of this and minimum kinetic energy of zero. And you know that's a perfectly valid uh, statement, valid description of a possible state of the ball. What the experiment is showing you is that that's not an achievable state. As in, um, so I was trying to see if I roll down the ball from here, that as it moves along this track, that it would eventually get to this position where the ball is here momentarily at rest. And I guess, and that was somehow not an achievable state. Why do you think uh, that state couldn't be achieved? As in, this ball never actually got to this position. What would you expect to see if I were to actually achieve this state, where the ball has this potential energy, as in it actually got to this position, and it has zero kinetic energy? What do you expect to see after that moment? It jumps straight down. Yeah, because you know I just I just release it from that state. It has zero velocity, so it would come straight down. Does that seem reasonable to you? I mean, reasonable in the sense that if the ball is doing this loop the loop. Is that the motion you would expect to see at some point in that motion? No, right? It, so, so, so this is where your visualization skill is important. Because it's really easy for you to simply write, write down this and think it's reasonable until you visualize what's going to happen starting from here or what it takes to get to this position. This is one of the actually weakness of conservation law strategy. Because conservation law strategy relies on snapshot, it doesn't really guarantee the processes which take you, this, take you to this point. You are kind of sort of either assuming that this snapshot will take place, or I guess what you really should have done is go through the um, sort of the imagination, visualization process so to confirm that this is something that's going to happen. And then once, you're very, once you are reasonably sure that this is an achievable state, then you do the rest of the calculation. So here, where you imagine what this state looks like, that's when you realize, oh, it's going to drop straight down. And that's not a reasonable motion for something that's going through the loop. So that's where you realize, where, where I hope you should realize that this assumption here is wrong. That minimum kinetic energy is, in fact, not zero. It's, it's going to be, have to be something else. So the minimum kinetic energy is something you need to figure out before you can proceed with the rest of this question. Yeah. All right. So, um, so I introduced this as a sort of a mixed strategy question. Um, so for the first part, we are going to we are trying to start this with the conservation of energy, as in we are hoping to come up with some kind of initial snapshot here. So let me call this um, snapshot one, and we are hoping to specify. I guess I'm not using green today. Um, we are so snapshot. One, we are hoping to specify some initial conditions, some initial potential energy. And I guess initial kinetic energy will be 0. And we are hoping to specify this, say that energy is conserved, and, um, 
and you know, solve for the, so you know, we, are, we would be trying to say, this starts off from some height, and we are hoping to be able to solve for this height here, right? So the expression that we are trying to set up initially, the expression that we are trying to set up initially had one unknown, the height. So in which case, we can set up the conservation of energy equation, one equation, and then solve for this height. As we are trying to apply that strategy, what we are beginning to find out is that I have one more unknown. So initially, I started out by assuming a particular value for the kinetic energy it needs to have here. What I'm discovering is that <laughs> it's not zero. And whatever that value is, I don't quite know it yet. And we did this on additional unknown. Conservation of energy, the way I was going to use it, is not enough anymore. So this is the question of problem solving. What do you do from here? So um, do you think conservation of energy is completely wrong, as in we have to scrap the whole thing and just start over from the beginning? Or do you think we will, at some point today, uh, at some point in the next 10, 15 minutes today, that we are going to actually use conservation of energy at some point? Like it still has a role to play. I just need to bring in additional pieces. Right? Yeah, so I'm not going to erase any of this. I'm going to use that eventually. But what I now need to do is I need to bring in additional tools. I need to figure out, okay, what else do I need to do so that I can address this additional unknown right now? So what strategy do you think I can use to try to figure out this additional unknown? It helps to go through a checklist. How many problem solving strategies have you learned in this class so far? So we have conservation of momentum. That's a possible strategy. What else? Hmm? Standard, strategy. Standard strategy. That's the one that you use whenever you are analyzing forces. Um, did I teach you anything else? Energy. Energy. Yeah, we are using already using energy. So that's in the list, but we have already used it. Or we are in the process of using it. So yeah, you really have two, mo two more strategies left that we haven't used it yet. I mean, maybe you could include the kinematics, but I don't see how kinematics will be helpful here, so let me fold it back. So it comes down to, all right, you have a list of two things. Hopefully one of those two is useful, or you're kind of stuck in the, you know, dead in the water. So, um, so you know, it's a 50-50 guess. Do you think I should be able to use conservation of momentum here, or standard strategy? Standard strategy. Here's a hint. This problem, of course, in worksheet seven, where we have not yet introduced the momentum. So, <laughs> so hopefully it doesn't require you to use the momentum. Um, so yeah, we are go you are going to have, have to use a standard strategy. So this is one way of guessing at it, just the process of elimination. Here's another way you could have figured this out. And it's a little bit tricky, because as you look at the situation, you are not realizing easily that there's a force involved in here somehow. And um, there's two different ways you can sort of get at the fact that there is going to be force involved. Any guesses what those two hints you can look at in the problem, Abdi? I mean, the fact that there's gravitational force, um, now if that's the criterion, then like there's no problem where you wouldn't try out the standard strategy, right? because the gravitational force is involved here also. So it does have to be beyond that, because when there's gravitational force involved, it's possible that you can address it by using potential energy associated with the gravity. So I want it to go a little bit beyond that. Normal. Why are you looking at normal force? Is there anything in the problem that hints at normal force? Uh, Andrew? Steven, are you going along the similar line? Right? Normal force is changing, but I mean, there are a lot of problems that involve normal force. Yeah. Like as in, if this is just rolling down from here to here, that involves normal force. But if I wanted to find the speed here, I wouldn't need to bring in normal force to actually answer that. 
because in conservation of energy, normal force is you know, perpendicular to the displacement. It doesn't change energy. Steven, you had a? Because uh, it's going around the loop in a circle. Therefore, there should be a centripetal acceleration. The yeah. force should be applied around yeah. So Steven says that the ball is going around in a circle. And that's actually a big hint, that this is a circular motion. When you hear circular motion, I want you to have this automatic association, acceleration. Whenever something is moving in circle, it's going to have acceleration, centripetal acceleration. Meaning, just from me saying that this is going around in this way, what color haven't I used? Mm. All right. Just from me saying that this is going around in a path like this, that this is, that I've, that already establishes, oh, there has to be acceleration. In fact, at this position here, this is going to be accelerating downward. Okay? Otherwise, if it's not accelerating towards the center, then that's inconsistent with the fact that it's moving in a circle. So the fact, so circular motion is a big hint that when there's a circular motion, that's going to involve centripetal acceleration, which involves identifying something as the centripetal force. And to sort of figure that out, you will probably need to use a standard strategy. And here's the second thing that this uh, leads to. Where, what force is this centripetal acceleration coming from? What are you identifying as a centripetal force? As in, let me imagine this. Let me imagine drawing, okay, now that we identify, all right, it involves acceleration, we are gonna have to deal with the forces. Let's say we are now dealing with a free body diagram then. You know, this is step number one of the standard strategy. So when the ball is over here in uh, snapshot number two, um, what are the forces on this ball that's going to cause acceleration towards the center? There's going to be gravity, which happens to be pointing in the convenient direction. Any other force? Yeah, normal force. So normal force is actually the one that plays an important role in all the other parts of the motion. Because you know, when the ball is here, gravity points downward, so it must be the normal force that's providing centripetal acceleration. So in this position, gravity and normal force happens to point in the same direction. And this is where I hope you are thinking about the difference between where this is at just to the right minimum height. It should be around here. I was testing it out. When it's, uh, when it's barely at the minimum height, maybe somewhere here. OK, one more. Somewhere here, <laughs> minimum height. Versus when this is way more than minimum height. Because in both of those cases, this is still undergoing the same circular motion at a different speed, which means this centripetal acceleration of v squared over r will be a different value. Gravity doesn't change. You need to have a force that you can change to give the correct centripetal acceleration. That's going to be the normal force. Okay? So, Okay, so that actually brings in a question which would relate to um, the normal force. So what do you think the value of normal force should be for the case that you are looking for, for the minimum speed of the ball, so minimum height that it's starting out at? What should the normal force be? Anyone have an intuitive answer? Zero. zero? Everyone intuitively thinks that this should be zero at minimum? And in fact, this is the second way you could have looked at this picture and figure out that you are going to have to deal with the standard strategy. As in, you know, you imagine, uh, you know, once again, visualize the motion of the ball. So when I was trying out the first case where I was doing this, the ball did not stay in contact with the uh, track. At some point, it came off from the track and fell off. And I don't know if uh, the question actually mentions this. Sometimes it has the right wording to remind you of that. Sometimes it doesn't. So in this particular question, it says, mm, yeah, it doesn't have, uh, here, here. Um, so when you look at it, it says, a skier wants to make a successful loop-the-loop. -loop. Ah, and here is it. 
that is make it through the vertical loop without his, this is the phrase, losing contact with the surface. And this is uh, one of those, um, I like to refer to it as code words, because uh, it, you need, uh, it's a matter of being able to understand the physics question. A good chunk of it is being able to read word description like this and understanding what mathematical condition this is specifying. So description like losing contact with the surface, that actually has a very specific meaning that you can express it with a mathematical equation. What happens the moment skier loses contact with the surface? False, okay. But um, there can be many different acceleration or velocity that the skier can have as they are losing contact. I want to describe one particular condition that I can describe that will be the same throughout every single time somebody's losing contact with the surface. Once again, the acceleration is going to be different for, so here's, um, yeah, acceleration, I, I can, so you said the acceleration is going to be what? Um, I, I don't think I understood what you meant. Yeah, so I'm looking for a succinct description with, that I can write down you know, as a mathematical equation and use it in my problem solving. And if you are trying to describe acceleration, that is just going to be different in um, so many cases. So, so I don't want to do it by trying to describe. So acceleration has nothing to do with losing contact. I want to describe some kind of force that's directly associated with something losing contact, like at the moment of losing contact. Asia. Yeah, normal force equal to zero. Because the normal force is the contact force. So whenever you, something is in contact with something, one thing you can say about normal force, it's not zero. Otherwise, it won't be you know, at zero. Now, if something has completely lost the contact and never touched anything, then you can't quite say anything about normal force. But the moment something is losing contact is the moment that normal force barely goes to zero. So that's the condition. And you know, it does take a practice looking at different problems and sort of making connection between this statement and that n goes to zero. But once you realize that, then you see, oh, this problem involves force then that would, that would be the second path that would lead you to this uh, exact same step. But once you get this far, once you come to this realization, then the rest becomes easy. It's a question of, can we answer this question? How much uh, minimum kinetic energy it needs to have here? Or the equivalent version of the same question is, or what is the minimum speed at the top so that so that the ball here is consistent with this picture, where it's accelerating downward at g, and um, yeah, accelerating downward at g, since the normal force will be, will be zero. Yeah. OK, let me go through. So, so you know, if you need to do it, then from here on, you can do the full standard strategy if you want. This is step number one. Step number two, define coordinate axis downward. And, um, and I guess no components to break it down into. And then uh, step number four, write down Newton's second law equations. So this is a pretty simple situation once the normal force goes to zero. So let me skip to the step number four, uh, writing down Newton's second law equations. Then downward force of gravity, mg, has to be equal to the net force, mass times acceleration, but acceleration has nothing directly to do with the speed. So How, we have yeah, we have that it's a circular motion. So do that also. And so here this V will be the minimum speed at the top. Minimum speed at the top squared over R. So that's it. Um, now we have enough information to solve for minimum kinetic energy then we can go all the way back here and solve for this um, height, which is what we wanted to find out in the first place. So, uh, so let's go through this uh, quickly. So mass cancels out. It, the whole thing doesn't depend on mass. Let me solve this for this minimum speed at the top. So the minimum speed at the top, actually let me solve it for this thing squared. Um, then it will be 
R times G, right? And I can use this to calculate the minimum kinetic energy. The minimum kinetic energy has to be 1 half M if we mean at the top squared. Everyone here remember the formula for kinetic energy? Yes. Um, and so, all right, so this is, um, so I can plug this in for this uh, uh, speed squared. Then I get 1 half M um, RG. That's the minimum kinetic energy that the ball needs to have one, when it arrives at this position so that it will be able to continue on and complete this uh, circular loop. Yeah, this, so you're, um, Alice asking about uh, where is the substitution coming from? Uh, no. Okay. Bottom one. Next. This one. Yeah. Okay, let me write down the cleaned up version of this equation here. The cleaned up version of this equation is G, the, the far left side, oh. yeah, equal to the right hand side. Yeah, let me finish writing it. V mean top. Square. Uh, by the way, um, I will skip some algebra steps, and that's a partly because I want you to practice, start practicing your algebra. Uh, in your entire science engineering career, your most important math skill will be algebra. So you know, I do want you to point out where my skipped steps will confuse you so that I can do that. But what I want you to start doing is you have to be practicing algebra so that some of this can be done in your head. Yeah. Good. OK. Um, so that's the minimum kinetic energy. Now that's no longer a question mark. This is now a known quantity. So you know, in this problem, in the course of the problem solving, essentially you had to work out this mini problem here to answer one unknown that came up in the process of answering this question. Now that I have answered this mini problem, here's my answer. That means I can continue on with my previous problem solving. As in, I was going to use conservation of energy. Let's see if we can you know, finish the problem using my initial approach. Good? OK, so let me write that down. So I'm going to try to use conservation of energy. So what do you do when you are trying to use conservation law strategy? So I wrote down you know, some stuff about potential and kinetic energy. Some stuff about potential and kinetic energy. Uh, Abdi, what are you saying I should do? Um, we're going to put the equation at the initial and then at the final. What about uh, make that into an equation? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, whenever you are using any kind of conservation law, so um, what you are doing is you are saying that the, you look at the conserved quantity, in this case, energy that the conserved quantity at one point, called this total energy at point one, is equal to the conserved quantity at some other point, called this total energy two. That's the very basic thing that you do with any, whenever you are applying conservation law strategy. That total energy at some point, if you are doing energy, is equal to total energy at some other snapshot. And the thing you have to pay attention to is, um, you know, so which, some of which was done here already. And, you, know, you have to answer these questions for yourself for a new problem. Is, you know, is this quantity conserved? Is energy conserved? Is momentum conserved? Um, and you know, is this useful? As in, OK, let's say it's conserved. Will this help us answer this question? And part of doing this drill is something that um, I want to use some of the lab time for. So let's wrap up this question. We say, start out with this. Total energy at point one is equal to total energy at point two. And I'm going to write this out. So total energy is potential plus kinetic. So at point one, it'll be mgh plus kinetic. That should be equal to the potential energy at the um, point two. That would be 2 mgr plus the kinetic energy. Now we don't say it's 0. We say it's 1 half mrg. So plus 1 half m or mgr. 
let me do it in a way that's consistent. All right. So this is an equation, one equation with a single unknown. So we should be able to solve it. Let's uh, go through that. Masses should cancel out. Oh, G cancels out too, because it's in every single term. Oh, that means I think I already solved it for H. <laughs> It's, it's a pretty simple algebra. So that's actually one of the reasons we li I like a conservation law strategy. The math involved in conservation law strategy often tends to be simpler than anything else you might see. So height, minimum height that I need to start out at is equal to 2R plus 1 half R. Uh, I guess I should write it that way. 2R or 2 plus 1 half R. So our earlier guess was 2R, that that would give us enough energy. And what this uh, calculation is now showing is that, well, I need to add a little bit of uh, enough height in the starting position so that it'll have enough kinetic energy to keep moving here. So let's try that. So this is 2R, right? Tell me where to start for 1 half R. About here? About here? Okay, I'm gonna move it up a little bit more for friction. Because if I release it here, it's gonna lose some energy as it goes down, so it won't be enough. So let me move it up a little bit here for friction, and let's see if it does the loop. Yeah, well, almost barely. <laughs> so it's a matter of how much I need to account for friction. But okay, one thing I can say is if this starts out at 3R, that should definitely be more than enough. So this is about 3R, the height of the loop plus the radius. Okay, let's start at 3R. And yeah, 3R is definitely more than enough. Good. So this is an example of um, problem where it, we sometimes call it mixed strategy problem. As in, you use conservation law strategy, doesn't turn out to be enough, so you have to, you have to bring in other tools that are in your toolbox. And um, so, so yeah, I think for the problems we are looking at today, this might be the only question that where you have to deal with that. So you'll get more practice on looking at questions like this during the lab section. But for the rest of the time today, um, I'll probably be doing mostly just the conservation law questions. Good. Any questions on this problem? Anything that was confusing or unclear? Okay, yeah, once you get it, it's actually a pretty simple problem. It's not a complicated problem. 